Hello everyone, this is Natalie at Kalamazoo Public Library and we are going to begin uh, Percy Jackson and the Olympians Book 5, The Last Olympian today. Uh, we are reading it on Hoopla, once again it is by Rick Riordan and I'm really excited to start this book. I did not read these books before I started reading them for you, and I have to say I really like them. I really liked Greek mythology when I was a kid, so reading a book about all of them is great. And I watched the movies that came out a few years ago, and I liked those, and I think I even own them, but the books are just so, so much better. Um, okay, so we are going to start book five today. Book four ended yesterday, The Battle of the Labyrinth, and I liked that it ended this time with Nico and Percy being friends, since book three, uh, when that one ended, the, um, basically, like, Nico was, like, running away from Percy, and so this time they're together, and they're buds, and then things are kind of weird between Percy and Annabeth right now. We don't even know. And last book, we met Rachel Elizabeth Dare, who was actually in the book before that, um, the Sea of Monsters one. She, like, can see through the, or no, she was in the middle one, the title I already forgot. There's so many titles, guys. Uh, anyway, she, like, can see through the mist. A regular human girl, but she can see right through the mist which is pretty cool. So let's read Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book five, The Last Olympian, and I will get to chapter one here. You can see there are so many books. And chapter one, I go cruising with explosives. The end of the world started when a Pegasus landed on the hood of my car. Up until then, I was having a great afternoon. Technically, I wasn't supposed to be driving because I wouldn't turn 16 for another week. But my mom and my stepdad, Paul, took my friend Rachel and me to this private stretch of beach on the South Shore, and Paul let us borrow his Prius for a short spin. Now I know what you're thinking. Wow, that's really irresponsible of him, blah, blah, blah. But Paul knows me pretty well. He's seen me slice up demons and leap out of exploding school buildings, so he probably figured taking a car a few hundred yards wasn't exactly the most dangerous thing I'd ever done. Anyway, Rachel and I were driving along. It was a hot August day. Rachel's red hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she wore a white blouse over her swimsuit. I'd never seen her in anything but ratty t-shirts and paint-splattered jeans before, and she looked like a million gold drachma. Oh, pull up right there, she told me. We parked on a ridge overlooking the Atlantic. The sea is always one of my favorite places, but today it was especially nice. Glittery green and smooth as glass, like my dad was keeping it calm just for us. My dad, by the way, is Poseidon. He can do stuff like that. So, Rachel smiled at me. About that invitation. Oh, right. I tried to sound excited. I mean, she'd asked me to her family's vacation house on St. Thomas for three days. I didn't get a lot of offers like that. My family's idea of a fancy vacation was a week on, weekend in a rundown cabin on Log Island with some movie rentals and a couple of frozen pizzas, and here Rachel's folks were willing to let me tag along to the Caribbean. Besides, I seriously needed a vacation. The summer had been the hardest of my life. The idea of taking a break even for a few days was really tempting. Still, something big was supposed to go down any day now. I was on call for a mission. Even worse, next week was my birthday. There was a prophecy that said when I turned 16, bad things would happen. Percy, she said, I know the timing is bad, but it's always bad for you, right? She had a point. I really want to go, I promised. It's just the war. I nodded. I didn't like talking about it, but Rachel knew. Unlike most mortals, she could see through the mist. The magic veil that distorts human vision. She'd seen monsters. She'd met some of the other demigods who were fighting the Titans and their allies. She even, she'd even been there last summer when the chopped up Lord Kronos rose out of his coffin in a terrible new form, and she'd earned my permanent respect by nailing him in the eye with a blue plastic hairbrush. She put her hand on my arm. Just think about it, okay? We don't leave for a couple of days. My dad, she, her voice faltered. Is he giving you a hard time? I asked. Rachel shook her head in disgust. He's trying to be nice to me, which is almost worse. He wants me to go to Clarion Ladies Academy in the fall. The school where your mom went? 
It's a stupid finishing school for society girls all the way in New Hampshire. Can you see me in finishing school? I admitted the idea sounded pretty dumb. Rachel was into urban art projects and feeding the homeless and going to protest rallies to save the endangered yellow-bellied sapsucker and stuff like that. I'd never even seen her wear a dress. It was hard to imagine her learning to be a socialite. She sighed. He thinks if he does a bunch of nice stuff for me, I'll feel guilty and give in. Which is why he agreed to let me come with you guys on vacation? Yes, but Percy, you'd be doing me a huge favor. It would be so much better if you were with us. Besides, there's something I want to talk... She stopped abruptly. Something you want to talk about? I asked. You mean, so serious we'd have to go to St. Thomas to talk about it? She pursed her lips. Look, just forget it for now. Let's pretend we're a couple of normal people. We're out for a drive, and we're watching the ocean. And it's nice to be together. I could tell something was bothering her, but she put on a brave smile. The sunlight made her hair look like fire. We'd spent a lot of time together this summer. I hadn't exactly planned it that way, but the more serious things got at camp, the more I found myself needing to call up Rachel and get away, just for some breathing room. I needed to remind myself the mortal world was still out there, away from all the monsters using me as their personal punching bag. Okay, I said, just a normal afternoon and two normal people. She nodded. And so, hypothetically, if these two people liked each other, what would it take to get the stupid guy to kiss the girl, huh? Oh. I felt like one of Apollo's sacred pals. Slow, dumb, and bright red. Um... I can't pretend I hadn't thought about Rachel. She was so much easier to be around than, well, than some other girls I knew. I didn't have to work hard, or watch what I said, or rack my brain trying to figure out what she was thinking. Rachel didn't hide much. She let you know how she felt. I'm not sure what I would have done, but I was so distracted I didn't notice the huge black form swooping down from the sky until four hooves landed on the hood of the Prius with a wump wump crunch. Hey boss, a voice said in my head, nice car. Blackjack the Pegasus was an old friend of mine, so I tried not to get too annoyed by the craters he just put in the hood. I didn't think my stepdad would be real stoked. Blackjack, I sighed. What are you? Then I saw who was riding his back, and I knew my day was about to get a lot more complicated. Sup, Percy? Charles Beckendorf, senior counselor for the Avicis cabin, would make most monsters cry for their mommies. He was this huge African-American guy with ripped muscles from working in the forges every summer. He was two years older than me and one of the camp's best armorsmiths. He made some seriously ingenious mechanical stuff. A month before, he'd rigged a Greek firebomb in the bathroom of a tour bus that was carrying a bunch of monsters across country. The explosion took out a whole legion of Kronos' evil meanies as soon as the first harpy went flush. Beckendorf was dressed for combat. He wore a bronze breastplate and war helm with black camel pants and a sword strapped to his side. His explosive bag was slung over his shoulder. Time? I asked. He nodded grimly. A clump formed in my throat. I knew this was coming. We'd been planning it for weeks, but I'd have hoped it would never happen. Rachel looked up at Beckendorf. Hi. Oh, hey. I'm Beckendorf. You must be Rachel. Percy's told me, uh... I mean, he mentioned you. Rachel raised an eyebrow. Really? Good. She glanced at Blackjack, who was clopping his hooves against the hood of the Prius. So I guess you guys have to go save the world now. Pretty much, Beckendorf agreed. I looked at Rachel helplessly. Will you tell my mom? I'll tell her. I'm sure she's used to it. And I'll explain to Paul about the hood. I nodded my thanks. I figured this might be the last time Paul loaned me his car. Good luck. Rachel kissed me before I could even react. Now get going, Half-Blood. Go kill some monsters for me. My last view of her was sitting in the shotgun seat of the Prius, her arms crossed, watching as Blackjack circled higher and higher, carrying Beckendorf and me into the sky. I wondered what Rachel wanted to talk to me about and whether I'd live long enough to find out. So, Beckendorf said, I'm guessing you don't want me to mention that little scene to Annabeth. Oh, gods, I muttered. Don't even think about it. Beckendorf chuckled, and together we soared out over the Atlantic. It was almost dark by the time we spotted our target. The Princess Andromeda glowed on the horizon. 
a huge cruise ship lit up by lit up yellow and white. From a distance, you'd think it was just a party ship, not the headmasters for the Titan Lord. Then, as you got closer, you might notice the giant masthead, a dark-haired maiden in a Greek uh, chiton, who hepped in chains with a look of horror on her face, as if she could smell the stench of all the monsters she was being forced to carry. Seeing the ship again twisted my guts into knots. I'd almost died twice on the Princess Andromeda. Now it's heading straight for New York. You know what to do? Beckendorf yelled over the wind. I nodded. We'd done dry runs at the dockyards in New Jersey, using abandoned ships as our targets. I knew how little time we would have, but I also knew this was our best chance to end Kronos' invasion before it ever started. Blackjack, I said, set us down on the lowest stern deck. Gotcha, boss, he said. Man, I hate seeing that boat. Three years ago, Blackjack had been enslaved on the Princess Andromeda until he'd escaped with a little help from my friends and me. I figured he'd rather have his mane braided like My Little Pony than be back here again. Don't wait for us, I told him. But boss, trust me, I said. We'll get out by ourselves. Blackjack folded his wings and plummeted toward the boat like a black comet. The wind whistled in my ears. I saw monsters patrolling the upper decks of the ship. Draconite snake women, hellhounds, giants and the humanoid sea de seal demons known as telekines. But we zipped by so fast, none of them raised the alarm. We shot down the stern of the boat, and Blackjack spread his wings, lightly coming to a landing on the lowest deck. I climbed off, feeling queasy. Good luck, boss, Blackjack said. Don't let them turn you into horse meat. With that, my old friend flew off into the night. I took my pen out of my pocket, uncapped it, and Riptide sprang to full size, three feet of, of deadly celestial bronze glowing in the dusk. Beckendorf pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket. I thought it was a map or something. Then I realized it was a photograph. He stared at it in the dim light. The smiling face of Selena Beauregard, daughter of Aphrodite. They'd started going out last summer, after years of the rest of us saying, Duh, you guys like each other. Even with all the dangerous missions, Beckendorf had, had been happier this summer than I'd ever seen him. We'll make it back to camp, I promised. For a second, I saw worry in his eyes. Then he put on his old confident smile. You bet, he said. Let's go, pro let's go blow Kronos back into a million pieces. Beckendorf led the way. We followed a narrow corridor to the service stairwell, just like we'd practice, but we froze when we heard noises above us. I don't care what your nose says snarled a half-human, half-dog voice, a telekine. The last time you smelled half-blood, it turned out to be a meatloaf sandwich. Meatloaf sandwiches are good, a second voice snarled. But this is half-blood scent. I swear, they're on board. Ugh, your brain isn't on board. They continued to argue, and Beckendorf pointed downstairs. We descended as quietly as we could. Two floors down, the voices of the telekine started to fade. Finally, we came to a metal hatch. Beckendorf mouthed the words, engine room. It was locked, but Beckendorf pulled some chain cutters out of his bag and split the bolt like it was made of butter. Inside, a row of yellow turbines the size of grain silos churned and hummed. Pressure gauges and computer terminals lined the opposite wall. A telekine was hunched over a console, but he was so involved with his work he didn't notice us. He was about five feet tall, with slick black seal fur and stubby little feet. He had the head of a Doberman, Doberman, but his clawed hands were almost human. He growled and muttered as he tapped on his keyboard. Maybe he was messaging his friends on UglyFace.com. I stepped forward, and he tensed, probably smelling something was wrong. He leaped sideways toward a big red alarm button, but I blocked his path. He hissed and lunged at me, but one slice of riptide, and he exploded into dust. One down, Beckendorf said. About 5,000 to go. He tossed me a jar of thick green liquid, Greek fire, one of the most dangerous magical substances in the world. Then he threw me another essential tool of demigod heroes, duct tape. Slap that one on the console, he said. I'll get the turbines. We went to work. The room was hot and humid, and in no time we were drenched in sweat. The boat kept chugging along. Being the son of Poseidon and all, I have perfect bearings at sea. Don't ask me how, but I could tell we were at 40.19 degrees north, 71.90 degrees west. 
making 18 knots, which meant the ship would arrive in New York Harbor by dawn. This would be our only chance to stop it. I had just attached a second jar of Greek fire to the control panels when I heard the pounding of feet on metal steps. So many creatures coming down the stairwell, I could hear them over the engines. Not a good sign. I locked eyes with Beckendorf. How much longer? Too long, he tapped his watch, which was our remote control detonator. I still have to wire the receiver and prime the charges. Ten more minutes at least. Judging from the sound of the footsteps, we had about ten seconds. I'll distract them, I said. Meet you at the rendezvous point. Percy, wish me luck. He looked like he wanted to argue. The whole idea had been to get in and out without being spotted, but we were going to have to improvise. Good luck, he said. I charged out the door. A half dozen telekines were tromping down the stairs. I cut through them with Riptide faster than they could yell. I kept climbing, past another telekine who was so startled he dropped his little demon's lunchbox. I left him alive, partly because his lunchbox was cool, partly so he could raise the alarm, and hopefully get his friends to follow me rather than head toward the engine room. I burst through a door onto deck six and kept running. I'm sure the carpeted hall had once been very plush, but over the last three years of monster occupation, the wallpaper, carpet, and stateroom doors had been clawed up and slimed so it looked like the inside of a dragon's throat. And yes, unfortunately, I speak from experience. Back on my first visit to the Princess Andromeda, my old enemy Luke had kept some base tourists on board for show, shrouded in a mist so they didn't realize that they were on a monster-infested ship. Now I didn't see any sign of tourists. I hated to think what had happened to them, but I kind of doubted they'd been allowed to go home with their bingo winnings. I reached the promenade, a big shopping mall that took up the whole middle of the ship, and I stopped cold. In the middle of a courtyard stood a fountain, and in the fountain squatted a giant crab. I'm not talking giant like $7.99 all-you-can-eat Alaskan king crab. I'm talking giant like bigger than the fountain. The monster rose ten feet out of the water. Its shell was mottled blue and green. Its pinchers longer than my body. If you've ever seen a crab's mouth, all foamy and gross with whiskers and snapping bits, you can imagine this one didn't look any better blown up to billboard size. Its beady black eyes glared at me, and I could see intelligence in them, and hate. The fact that I was the son of the sea god was not going to win me any points with Mr. Crabby. <sighs> it hissed. Sea foam dripping from its mouth. The smell coming off it was like a garbage can full of fish sticks that had been sitting in the sun all week. Alarms blared. Soon I was going to have lots of company and I had to keep moving. Hey, Crabby. I inched toward the edge of the courtyard. I'm just going to scoot around you, so... The crab moved with amazing speed. It scuttled out of the fountain and came straight at me, pinchers snapping. I dove into a gift shop, plowing through a rack of t-shirts. A crab pincher smashed the glass walls to pieces and raked across the room. I dashed back outside, breathing heavily, but Mr. Crabby turned and followed. There, a voice said from the balcony above me. Intruder! If I'd wanted to create a distraction, I'd succeeded. But this was not where I wanted to fight. I got pinned down in the center of the ship. I was crab chow. The demonic crustacean lunged at me. Sliced with Riptide, taking off the tip of its claw. It hissed and foamed, but didn't seem very hurt. I tried to remember anything from the old stories that might help with this thing. Annabeth had told me about a monster crab. Something about Hercules crushing it under its foot? That wasn't going to work here. This crab was slightly bigger than my Reeboks. Then a weird thought came to me. Last Christmas, my mom and I had brought Paul Blofus to our old cabin in Montauk, where we'd been going forever. Paul had taken me crabbing, and when he'd brought up a net full of the things, he'd shown me how crabs have a chink in their armor, right in the middle of their ugly bellies. The only problem was getting to the ugly belly. I glanced at the fountain, then at the marble floor, already slick from scuttling, er, scuttling crab tracks. I held out my hand, concentrating on the water, and the fountain exploded. Water sprayed everywhere, three stories high, bouncing the balconies and the elevators and the windows of the shops. The crab didn't care. He loved water. He came at me sideways, snapping and hissing, and I ran straight at him, screaming, Ah! Just before we collided, I hit the ground baseball style and slid on the wet marble floor straight under him. It was like sliding under a seven-ton armored vehicle. 
All the crab had to do was sit and squash me. But before he realized what was going on, I jabbed Riptide into the chink in his armor, let go of the hilt, and pushed myself out the backside. The monster shuddered and hissed. His eyes dissolved. His shell turned bright red as his insides evaporated. The empty shell clattered to the floor in a massive heap. I didn't have time to admire my handiwork. I ran for the nearest stairs while all around me monsters and demigods shouted orders and strapped on their weapons. I was empty-handed. Riptide, being magic, would appear in my pocket sooner or later, but for now it was stuck somewhere under the wreckage of the crab, and I had no time to retrieve it. In the elevator foyer on deck eight, a couple of draconates slithered across my path. From the waist up, there were they were women with green scaly skin, yellow eyes, and forked tongues. From the waist down, they had double snake trunks instead of legs. They held spears and weighted nets, and I knew from experience they could use them. What is this? One said. A prize for Kronos? I wasn't in the mood to play Break the Snake, but in front of me was a stand with a model of a chip, like a You Are Here display. I ripped the model off the pedestal and hurled it at the first dragon up. The boat smacked her in the face and she went down with the ship. I jumped over her, grabbed her friend's spear, and swung her around. She slammed into the elevator and I kept running towards the front to get to the front of the ship. Get him! she screamed. Hellhounds bayed. An arrow from somewhere whizzed past my face and impaled itself in the mahogany paneled wall of the stairwell. I didn't care, as long as I got the monsters away from the engine room and gave back and door for more time. As I was running up the stairwell, a kid charged down. He looked like he'd just woken up from a nap. His armor was half on. He drew his sword and yelled, Kronos! But he sounded more scared than angry. He couldn't have been more than twelve. About the same age I was when I first went to Camp Half-Blood. That thought depressed me. This kid was getting brainwashed, trained to hate the gods and lash out because he'd been born half Olympian. Kronos was using him, and yet the kid thought I was his enemy. No way was I going to hurt him. I didn't need a weapon for this. I stepped inside his strike and grabbed his wrist, slamming it against the wall. His sword clattered out of his hand. Then I did something I hadn't planned on. It was probably stupid. Definitely jeopardized our mission, but I couldn't help it. If you want to live, I told him, get off the ship now. Tell the other demigods. Then I shoved him downstairs and sent him tumbling to the next floor. I kept climbing. Bad memories. A hallway ran past the cafeteria. Annabeth, my half-brother Tyson, and I had sneaked through here years ago on my first visit. I burst outside onto the main deck. Off the port bell, the sky was darkening from purple to black. A swimming pool glowed between two glass towers with more balconies and restaurant decks. The whole upper chip seemed eerily deserted. All I had to do was cross to the other side. Then I could take the staircase down to the helipad, our emergency rendezvous point. With any luck, Beckendorf would meet me there. We'd jump into the sea. My water powers would protect us both, and we'd detonate the charges from a quarter mile away. I was halfway across the deck when the sound of a voice made me freeze. You're late, Percy. Luke stood on the balcony above me, a smile on his scarred face. He wore jeans, a teacher, and flip-flops, like he was just a normal college-age guy. But his eyes told the truth. They were solid gold. We've been expecting you for days. At first he sounded normal, like Luke. But then his face twitched. A shudder passed through his body, like he'd just drunk something really nasty. His voice became heavier, ancient, and powerful. The voice of the Titan Lord Kronos. The words scraped down my spine like a knife blade. Come, bow before me. Yeah, that'll happen, I muttered. Lastragonian giants filed in on either side of the swimming pool as if they'd been waiting for a cue. Each was eight feet tall with tattooed arms, leather armor, and spiked clubs. Demigod archers appeared on the roof above Luke. Two hellhounds leapt down from the opposite balcony and snarled at me. Within seconds, I was surrounded. A trap. There was no way they could have gotten into position so fast unless they'd known I was coming. I looked up at Luke, and anger boiled inside me. I didn't know if Luke's consciousness was even still alive inside that body. Maybe the way his voice had changed, or maybe it was just Kronos adapting to his new form. I told myself it didn't matter. 
Luke had been twisted and evil long before Kronos possessed him. A voice in my head said, I have to fight him eventually. Why not now? According to that big prophecy, I was supposed to make a choice that saved or destroyed the world when I was 16. That was only seven days away. Why not now? If I really had that power, what difference would a week make? I could end this threat right here by taking down Kronos. Hey, I'd fought monsters and gods before. As if reading my thoughts, Luke smiled. No, he was Kronos. I had to remember that. Come forward, he said, if you dare. The crowd of monsters parted, and I moved up the steps, my heart pounding. I was sure someone would stab me in the back, but they let me pass. I felt my pocket and found my pen waiting. I uncapped it, and Riptide grew into a sword. Kronos's weapon appeared in his hands. A six-foot-long scythe, half celestial bronze, half mortal steel. Just looking at the thing made my knees turn to jello. But before I could change my mind, I charged. Time slowed down. I mean literally slowed down, because Kronos had that power. I felt like I was moving through syrup. My arms were so heavy, I could barely raise my sword. Kronos smiled, swirling his scythe at normal speed and waiting for me to creep toward my death. I tried to fight his magic. I concentrated on the sea around me, the source of my power. I'd gotten better at channeling it over the years, but now nothing seemed to happen. I took another slow step forward. Giants jeered. Dragone hissed with laughter. Hey, Ocean, I pleaded. Any day now would be good. Suddenly, there was a wrenching pain in my gut. The entire boat lurched sideways, throwing monsters off their feet. 4,000 gallons of salt water surged out of the swimming pool, bouncing me and Kronos and everyone on deck. The water revitalized me, breaking the time spell, and I lunged forward. I struck at Kronos, but I was still too slow. I made the mistake of looking at, looking at his face, Luke's face, a guy who was once my friend. As much as I hated him, it was hard to kill him. Kronos had no such hesitation. He sliced downward with the scythe. I leaped back, and the evil blade missed by an inch, cutting a gash in the deck right between my feet. I kicked Kronos in the chest. He stumbled backward, but he was heavier than Luke should have been. It was like kicking a refrigerator. Kronos swung his scythe again. I intercepted with Riptide, but his strike was so powerful, my blade could only deflect it. The edge of the scythe shaved off my shirt sleeve and grazed my arm. It shouldn't have been a serious cut, but the entire side of my body exploded with pain. I remembered what a sea demon that had once said about Kronos' scythe. Careful, fool. One touch, and the blade will sever your soul from your body. Now I understood what he meant. I wasn't just losing blood. blood. I could feel my strength, my will, my identity draining away. I stumbled backwards, switched my sword to my left hand, and lunged desperately. My blade should have run him through, but it deflected off his stomach like I was hitting solid marble. There was no way he should have survived that. Kronos laughed. A poor performance, Percy Jackson. Luke tells me you were never his match at swordplay. My vision started to blur. I knew I didn't have much time. Luke had a big head, I said, but at least it was his head. A shame to kill you now, Kronos mused, before the final plan unfolds. I would love to see the terror in your eyes when you realize how I will destroy Olympus. You'll never get to this boat to Manhattan. My arm was throbbing. Black spots danced in my eyes. And why would that be? Kronos's golden eyes glittered. His face. Luke's face seemed like a mask unnatural and lit from behind by some evil power. Perhaps you were counting on your friend with the explosives? He looked down at the pool and called, Nakamura! A teenage guy in full Greek armor pushed through the crowd. His left eye was covered with a black patch. I knew, of him, knew him, of course. Ethan Nakamura, the son of Nemesis. I'd saved his life in the labyrinth last summer, and in return, that little punk had helped Kronos come back to life. Success, my lord, Ethan called. We found him just as we were told. He clapped his hands, and two giants lumbered forward, dragging Charles Beckendorf between them. My heart almost stopped. Beckendorf had a swollen eye and cuts all over his face and arms. His armor was gone and his shirt nearly torn off. No, I yelled. Beckendorf met my eyes. He glanced at his hand like he was trying to tell me something. His watch. They hadn't taken it yet. That would be the detonator. 
Was it possible the explosives were armed? Surely the monsters would have dismantled them right away. We found him amid ships, one of the giants said, trying to sneak to the engine room. Can we eat him now? Soon, Kronos scowled at Ethan. Are you sure he didn't set the explosive? He was going toward the engine room, my lord. How do you know that? Er, Ethan shifted uncomfortably. He was heading in that direction. He told us. The bag is still full of explosives. Slowly, I began to understand. Beckendorf had fooled them. When he realized he was going to be captured, he turned to make it look like he was going the other way. He'd convinced them that he hadn't made it to the engine room yet. The Greek fire might still be primed. But that didn't do us any good unless we could get off the ship and detonate it. Kronos hesitated. By the story, I prayed. The pain in my arm was so bad now I could barely stand. Open his bag, Kronos ordered. One of the giants ripped the explosive satchel from Beckendorf's shoulders. He peered inside, grunted, and turned it upside down. Panic monsters surged backward. If the bag really had been full of Greek fire jars, we would have all blown up. But what fell out were a dozen cans of peaches. I could hear Kronos breathing, trying to control his anger. Did you, perhaps, he said, capture this demigod near the galley? Ethan turned pale. Um, and did you, perhaps, send someone to actually check the engine room? Ethan scrambled back in terror, and then turned on his heels and ran. I cursed silently. Now we only had minutes before the bombs were disarmed. I caught Beckendorf's eyes again and asked a silent question, hoping he would understand. How long? He cupped his fingers and thumb, making a circle. Zero. There was no delay on the timer at all. If he managed to press the detonator button, the ship would blow at once. We'd never be able to get far enough away before using it. The monsters would kill us first, or disarm the explosives, or both. Kronos turned toward me with a crooked smile. You'll have to excuse my incompetent help, Percy Jackson, but it doesn't matter. We have you now. We've known you were coming for weeks. He held out his hand and dangled a little silver bracelet with a scythe charm, the Titan Lord's symbol. The wound in my arm was sapping my ability to think, but I muttered, Communication device. Buy at camp. Kronos chuckled. You can't count on friends, and we'll always let you down. Luke learned that lesson the hard way. Now drop your sword and surrender to me, or your friend dies. I swallowed. One of the giants had his hand around Beckendorf's neck. I was in no shape to rescue him. Even if I tried, he would die before I got there. We both would. Beckendorf, mou Beckendorf mouthed one word. Go. I shook my head. I couldn't just leave him. The second giant was still rummaging through the peach cans, which meant Beckendorf's arm was free. He raised it slowly toward the watch on his right wrist. I wanted to scream, No! Then down by the swimming pool, one of the drachne hissed, What is he doing? What is that on his wrist? Beckendorf closed his eyes tight and brought his hand up to his watch. I had no choice. I threw my sword like a javelin at Kronos. It bounced harmlessly off his chest, but it did startle him. I pushed toward a crowd of monsters and jumped off the side of the ship, toward the water a hundred feet below. I heard rumbling deep in the ship. Ship. Monsters yelled at me from above. A spear sailed past my ear. An arrow pierced my thigh, but I barely had time to register the pain. I plunged into the sea and willed the currents to take me far, far away. A hundred yards. Two hundred yards. Even from that distance, the explosion shook the world. Heat seared the back of my head. The Princess Andromeda blew up from both sides, a massive fireball of green flame roiling into the dark sky, consuming everything. Beckendorf, I thought. Then I blacked out and sank like an anchor toward the bottom of the sea. Oh my gosh, I like Beckendorf. I was not expecting that. Okay, everybody have a good weekend, and we'll read Chapter 2 on Monday.